At any rate, uh, at the end of the summer, uh, we returned to Gila Pueblo in Globe. And this brings me to the point where I should make a few observations about Mr. Gladwin, who himself was not a trained archaeologist in an academic sense, and uh, uh, his association with Mrs. McCurdy. Mr. Gladwin was born in, in uh, New York State in 1883. He was schooled in England, lower schools and college. I think he went to uh, Wellington, if I remember correctly. And after his education in England, he came back to the United States and engaged in various activities trying to find himself. He was on a Jesuit ranch in uh, Montana for a while. He was uh, in the mining business for a while. And then um, he, he purchased a chair on the New York Stock Exchange and was in that business in the high financial circles of New York City. Well, this paled after so many years. And uh, he came to California, to Santa Barbara, became associated with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, where he worked on butterflies of all things. He made a very systematic collection of a particular type of butterfly and was trying to show some uh, genetic variations and uh, problems in connection with uh, species changes. During this time, he became acquainted with David Banks Rogers, who was an archaeologist, and uh, he became more and more interested in that subject. By an accident of circumstance, uh, he became acquainted with a man who was a relative of A.V. Kidder. And in 1924, they met in northern Arizona in the Hopi country and uh, toured the area. And this is what introduced Gladwin to the ruins in the southwestern United States. Uh, he became more and more interested in them and determined that he was going to do something with them or in them. And uh, at the same time he was working in California, he became acquainted with a lady by the name of Mrs. McCurdy. She was a New Yorker originally, or originally from Illinois, later in New York. And uh, they became interested in each other. Both had means, financial means, and this, of course, introduced, uh, as it were, a new element into the Southwest. Most of the archaeologists who were working here at that time were connected with universities and colleges. And um, the excavation of sites that had taken place up to that time, the big sites like Pueblo Bonito and uh, Pecos Ruin, was all Eastern philanthropy, financed with Eastern money. Well, here was a chance uh, for someone, to, some people to settle in the Southwest, establish a foundation, and uh, uh, work out of the Southwest itself at these sites without all the material going to the Eastern United States. Mr. Gladwin, uh, uh, through this chance acquaintance with uh, Kidder, developed a close association. And it was during a visit to Acoma in 1926 that uh, Kidder said, wouldn't it be wonderful, uh, Gladwin said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could show the materials that come from these ruins in a setting uh, which is consistent with their background or their origin. And Kidder agreed, of course. Well, out of that, Mr. Gladwin uh, uh, acquired a piece of property south of Globe, which had a ruin on it, began to ex excavate it with the idea of restoring it and showing the materials that came out of some of the excavations that he did uh, and uh, materials that he acquired uh, by purchase in a, a rather natural setting. Well, that uh, didn't work out quite that way because the requirements of uh, Indian domestic structures are quite different than the requirements of a modern uh, institution like Gila Pueblo is to be. At any rate, 
Moving back to Gila Pueblo introduced me to the, that part of the building that had been constructed by that time, which was substantial. We moved immediately into uh, a rhythm of excavation and uh, reporting, report writing that was uh, beyond uh, anybody's conception, at least my conception, and beyond the conception, or at least beyond the performance of those other people who were working in the Southwest at that time. We, he wanted to know what the resources were, archaeological resources, in the Western United States. So he began to catalog inventory sites all the way from the Mississippi Valley to California, from Montana, deep into Mexico, and uh, that meant devising a system of uh, inventorying uh, which I think was very successful. It made sense, a connected story. Uh, I might say that uh, up to that point, most of the archaeology that was being done in the Southwest was uh, a matter of uh, oppor opportunity. It was opportunistic in that here was a big ruin. It was an invitation to dig without any real reasons for doing so, other than to get materials to enrich the museums of the East. And uh, there was no real sense of problem. This was developed, uh, I would say that Kidder was the first to develop a uh, sense of problem in connection with the Southwest. Colton and Flagstaff had the same notion. Since the resources were there, that meant uh, getting into a trip hammer rhythm of digging and uh, report writing. Leaving Harvard behind, I came back to Arizona. Our excavations in a Hohokam site uh, to further define and refine that uh, Gila Basin country of the Pueblo people, Pueblo people, the Salados, the Salado Indians. And that uh, was first picked up by Frank Matulski, Frank Midvale, in his survey for Gila Pueblo in the 19, late 1920s. And this site is an extremely large one, covers about 200 acres. There were 60 mounds in the village, a large oval depression, and it was uh, it was a question, and there was a question in our minds, in our minds, whether or not these mounds were garbage heaps, middens, trash mounds, or whether they were actually melted down house mounds, as um, Los Muertos was when it was excavated, and as many other ruins are in the uh, in the lower Gila Basin or the middle Gila Basin. Shortly after we began to big, uh, dig, we soon found out, uh, were able to establish the fact that these mounds were not architectural, that they were composed of, of enormous quantities of refuse uh, thrown away by the people that lived there. This meant that this was a good-sized town. It was a town that had, to, by all evidences that one could read into this, a long history. So we felt that we could uh, greatly expand the Hohokam chronology by excavating in those mounds. We had to devise some stratigraphic techniques to do that. Uh, these mounds uh, in depth, some of them were as much as 15 feet. And uh, that's an enormous depth of refuse, which in itself is loose. A small mound, which was only about three feet above the desert, about like that, was the place to start. And I thought that the, the best way to tackle the problem was to see if we could get a slice of controlled material completely through a mound. That is, instead of just digging holes, doing stratigraphic tests level by level, to dig a, a slice clear through a mound. This material is very tricky. It's, uh, it, it caves off very easily. And while in that trench, uh, a big block of trash came up and buried me up in my hips. Well, that taught me a lesson that when we got into the real big bounds, uh, we had to dig a wide trench in order to safeguard the workers who were doing the testing. 
Well, from that we went to Mound 29 and uh, put in a very large test. That proved to be 15 feet deep and it had, it was built, the mound itself was built on one or two houses and underneath the house floors we found cremation so that there was a, a stratigraphy there not only of trash on architecture on the cremations but uh, it gave us a record of uh, through, uh, through the study of ceramics, uh, ceramic changes, we could see that there were there was a, a great lapse of time that the whole come prehistory, the history of the culture, had a much greater depth than we had supposed. And uh, by dating the latest material in the site which was done by cross-checking or cross-dating. And by that I mean that material from the plateau, black on white pottery, which had been dated by tree rings, was found as an intrusive in Snake Town. We not only found pieces, but whole vessels, particularly in cremations. That, that tree ring dated material occurring in Snake Town, where treating dates are not applicable, uh, we could make certain inferences about the age of the cultural materials at uh, Snake Town. So, uh, uh, the last phase at Snake Town, which we believe to have about a 200 year duration, was preceded by material, different pottery, different styles of pallets, and uh, artifactual materials, and we believe that period to be about 200 years long because in it we found intrusive material that dated about 200 years earlier in the Plateau country. And then we had uh, three or four phases, four, four or five phases prior to that based once again on ceramic differences uh, out of the lower parts of the rubbish accumulation. And uh, by applying this 200 year period to these undateable materials, we assumed, we inferred that these horizons that we call phases had a duration of about uh, 200 years and that gave us a whole calm chronology of uh, some uh, uh, back to about the time of Christ or two or three hundred years BC. Well, uh, that was the best we could do at that time. After all, that was in the 1930s, and the dating techniques, except for true rings, uh, were not what they are today. So uh, that introduces another problem. But uh, uh, with the Snake Town work, we had fleshed out the Snake Town, the whole come chronology, and uh, and broadened the scope, let's say, of the culture, and uh, I think clarified to some extent the relationship of those people with their northern neighbors uh, on the Colorado Plateau. I think a word of explanation here is needed uh, to account for the, the, uh, the name of the village, Snake Town. Remember that the, we had these six deep trash mounds and these mounds are composed of this old garbage going back hundreds, case, several cases, thousands of years, 2,000 years nearly. That material is soft and is preferred by rodents as nesting places so that these mounds are riddled with uh, gopher burrows and uh, kangaroo rats and whatnot. Rodents, of course, are the main diet of snakes and so the, the high population of rodents in this area of old, this old village attracted uh, more than the usual number of straight uh, snakes to the uh, spot and from that we called the place uh, Snake Town and uh, we did dig up uh, a number of snakes in the process of our excavations uh, but they they presented no hazard to us in any any form we just had to be careful that was all and by great good fortune it was left practically untouched most other big Snake Town settlements, by uh, the time we worked at Snake Town, had already been severely vandalized. But Snake Town, fortunately, was not uh, affected in that way. 
because it was uh, being watched uh, pretty carefully by the local Indians. They, they had no objection to our d digging there. We had a permit from them, and uh, they were greatly interested in what we were doing. It was all very peaceful, and they, uh, they helped us uh, excavate houses. The, the Homo come at that time did not build houses above the ground surface. In other words, they were not Pueblo builders, and this is one of the things that distinguishes them from the Anasazi of the Colorado Plateau. They were pit house livers, and uh, from early to late. Now, when you get into the late period, the classic period, which was covered by, let's say, Los Muertos and Casa Grande, this represents, in my opinion, the influx of Puebloid peoples into the desert country, the introduction of a new style of architecture, which is multi-storied high. Casa Grande is four stories in height. And uh, so that we have this fusion of cultures uh, at, in that late uh, time horizon. I should add that, uh, that Kidder wrote a book in 1924 uh, called Southwestern Archaeology. And in that, he recognized that uh, something was going on in the Gila country and in southern Arizona that was different than the archaeology of, the, say, the Colorado Plateau or of the Four Corners country. But uh, he did not feel competent to deal with it at that time. Uh, too little work had been done, and so he bypassed it. He left the door open. But um, this notice, or the notice of that fact by Kidder, uh, really came into prominence in, the late, in later times when people began to work in this region and were able to define what was there. And in this respect, Gladwin, I think, uh, played a key role in the definition of uh, the whole calm culture. So we didn't feel badly about introducing that term. Yes, that uh, causes me to go back to 1931 and uh, re-emphasizes the uh, fact that Gila Pueblo's main thrust was surveying to find out what's in the region, find out what the resources are. And uh, as a part of that overall aim, goal, Gladwin said, uh, I want you fellows, uh, you and Russ Hastings, you fellows to go up to the uh, mountain country uh, to do some surveying. So we went, first of all, to Sholo and uh, worked in that region. Then we dropped down to White River, established camp north of White River, working out of there, visited uh, the main ruins of that uh, part of the world, Kinishpa among them, Cedar Creek ruin, even Grasshopper, which you know well. And uh, from there we drifted over to Reserve New Mexico. I should say, I should point out that while it uh, camped at, uh, at uh, Sholo, we did a survey of the Forestdale Valley. And that excited us because we were beginning to pick up some sites that produced only brown ware, no black on whites, no red on buffs. And uh, <clears throat> that hinted at the possibility that we were dealing with another cultural complex. Well, over in the reserve part of the uh, section of New Mexico, we found more of those sites. Matter of fact, a good many of them. And then going south, we came upon uh, uh, a village on top of a isolated bluff or mesa. And uh, that not only had a, an abundance of brown pottery, brown corrugated pottery, but also a red on brown pottery. Not a red on buff, but a red on brown. And it was uh, technically and typologically different than the, the whole com pottery. Uh, from there we went to the members and uh, found a number of sites over there with some similar characteristics. And there was no provision for the accommodation of sites of this, uh, these ceramic characters in the Pecos classification. They did not fit the red on buff uh, taxonomy that we had developed. So uh, we toyed with the idea that we were dealing with a third cultural complex, main, major complex, here in the southwest. And since many of these sites were located 
in the New Mexico, Arizona borderland country, the mountainous country, and the Mugion Mountains were the uh, one of the big landmarks, topographic landmarks in that region. We called this uh, the culture the Mugion. Uh, there were no modern survivors as far as we could see. We didn't know what the people called themselves, so we just applied that name. Uh, that was reinforced by the the fact that uh, we we saw the surveying of sites, the inventorying of the archaeological resources as a means to an end and not an end in itself. And with that knowledge of the numerous sites, we could best pick and choose that site or those sites to excavate, which were most likely to answer the basic questions we were asking. And it was because of that uh, or through that technique that we uh, uh, selected the Maguillon village, which is one site in New Mexico. Uh, that was the first one that was excavated. And the Harris site a year later was further excavated. And those two gave us the, the uh, basis for, uh, let's say, defining what we thought was a new cultural complex, and that was the Maguillon. There were many skeptics on that, but I must say, and it's a great satisfaction to me, that through the years, I see a lot of people digging on Mugion sites and using the word Mugion <coughs> freely uh, without inhibition, and uh, I might say misusing it too. So, <laughs> uh, so we have further problems to resolve. At any rate, that's the basic origin of the, of, uh, the concept. I would have to say that after I came to the University of Arizona, that uh, the work we did in the Forestdale Valley, sites which had always excited us, uh, let, allowed us to uh, establish what characterized the Maguillon, but it provided, uh, those sites provided wonderful dating material and indicated to us that uh, the Maguillon people were producing pottery, that they had reached certain stages of cultural development before, prior to the Plateau people, the Anasazi, having reached the same stage. So we, uh, we felt quite sure that we were dealing with something here that uh, was con contemporary with, but in certain respects, antecedent the, the Anasazi people, uh, notably in the construction of pottery. So that, uh, that was a great help, and, and uh, it, I think more than anything else, helped establish the uh, authenticity of the concept. I left uh, principally because Dr. Cummings, who was uh, in his upper 70s, still at the university, uh, was about to be retired. The university did not then have a retirement system, and people could work almost until they dropped in their tracks. But he uh, was well advanced in years, and he came to Gila Pueblo, to Globe, and he said uh, to me, there is talk of my retirement at the University of Arizona. Would you be interested in coming to Tucson and taking over the department and the museum? That was in November of 1936. And um, I might, must say that Gila Pueblo had a board of directors consisting of Mrs. McCurdy, or then Mrs. Gladwin by that time, and Mr. Gladwin and uh, Dr. Kidder. And as it happened, Dr. Kidder was at, there at that time. So I called them all together and I said, here's what Dr. Cummings has asked me. Would I be interested in coming to, to, to Tucson? And uh, the board said, well, if uh, we would hate to see you leave, but if that's what you want to do, you have our blessing. So, uh, uh, nothing further happened. Uh, the coming situation here was uh, getting more t tense because uh, there were his disciples, and he had a lot of uh, wonderful supporters, 
were against his retirement because he was being shortchanged. They weren't gi giving him proper uh, compensation. But uh, the university promised him half of his former salary, which is a lot better than our present retirement system uh, accounts for. So uh, the local papers, uh, the Citizen, the Evening Paper, and the Morning Paper, the Star, took opposing sides on this issue. Well, that created quite a stir, and it made me wonder, once again, if I should uh, m make this change. But circumstances developed at Gila Pueblo. Uh, from the moment when I suggested that I might leave, the situation became a bit tense. And I had been warned about this by Dr. Douglas. His experience with Percival Lowell, the astronomer in Flagstaff who had established the Lowell Observatory, there was no, uh, no uh, grievance committee, for example, if things went wrong. And he had bad experiences there, and he just warned me about that when I went to Gila Pueblo. He said, there's no grievance committee. You're subject to the whims and the personal quirks of a few people. March came around, and things were a little bit, uh, the, the feeling between Gladwell and myself was becoming a little more intense all the time. And finally, an offer came through from the university, and uh, I accepted it, and uh, I made the change on July 1st. It was not the most pleasant break, but I, I must say that we got along in spite of it. And I came to Tucson and uh, started my uh, long tenure here, both in the department and in the museum. But I shall always reflect on my seven years at Gila Pueblo as having been very rich, very rewarding, because uh, there were so many opportunities. There was money to dig, money to publish, and there were lots of activity. And I learned more about the Southwest in those seven years than I could possibly have in any other way. And I think I met more people. All in all, I have never regretted uh, those seven years at Gila Pueblo. During my tenure at Gila Pueblo, uh, Ted Sales, E.B. Sales, was taken on the staff. And uh, he, of course, stayed on after I left. Ernst Antevs, a uh, geomorphologist uh, from Sweden originally, became uh, a sort of advisor to Gila Pueblo, and he worked extensively with sales on the Cochise culture in southeastern Arizona. Just before the war, uh, a new man had been added to the staff, and that was Derek Nussbaum, Derek O'Brien, later adopted that name. And uh, he worked uh, extensively with Mr. Gladwin, who had become interested in tree ring studies himself, devising new techniques, trying to refine those that uh, Douglas had developed. Then the war came, and uh, as a consequence of that, the activities at Gila Pueblo uh, really ground to a halt. Sales became uh, active in uh, mining work uh, related to war activities. And uh, Derek O'Brien joined the services, so that the activities at Gila Pueblo were at a standstill. O'Brien came back after the war, and Sales left Gila Pueblo staff, and I picked him up uh, as curator of the Arizona State Museum. It was clear by then that the institution was on the wane. The interest on the part of the Gladwins uh, was fading. They were spent less and less time there, more and more time in California. And uh, by 19, uh, say by 1949, uh, it was clear that things were going to uh, change. O'Brien was uh, digging in New Mexico in the summer of 49, I think it was, at Jewett Gap. And uh, in the middle of his dig, he was told by Gladwin to break camp, to shut down the operation. And uh, he was greatly crushed by this act, uh, really stymied in his researches. And he uh, went back to Gila Pueblo and literally 
closed shop. That is, uh, he, he left, and, uh, and Gladwin and uh, Mrs. Gladwin were then faced with the, with the problem of what to do with Gila Pueblo. It was difficult for any out-of-state organization to accept it. They offered it to Berkeley. Berkeley declined. They offered it to Harvard. Harvard declined. And then by default, as it were, uh, the offer came to the University of Arizona. Would the university be interested in accepting Gila Pueblo? It turns out that uh, the attorney for the Gladwins was a gentleman who was also attorney for the Inspiration Copper Company, and he was appointed as a member of the Board of Regents of the university. So uh, Gladwin approached this attorney, who was a member of the Board of Regents, to inquire from the president if we would uh, be interested in Gila Pueblo here at the university. The president of the university got a hold of Sales and myself, and he said, here's a possibility. Give me a plan by tomorrow noon, or whenever it was, uh, what you would do with the collection if uh, it came to the university. At any rate, uh, we drafted a plan, submitted it to the president. He referred it back to the attorney, and the attorney referred it back to the university, uh, to um, uh, Gladwin. And uh, they said uh, they that they would go along with these plans. With the Gladwin's acceptance of the idea, Ted and I were then faced with a Herculean job of transporting the collections from Globe to Tucson. Uh, remember, there were about 10,000 pots up there and a lot of other material as well. They gave us the institution as well as the collections, so the, the, the university, university had the buildings and the grounds. Well, we didn't know what to do with that. We brought 17 van loads of material down to Tucson. Sales was up at Globe, seeing that the material was packed, and I was in Tucson receiving, and we made certain rearrangements in the museum to accommodate these materials. Well, that was a big operation, but we got it done in jig time and without breakage, and. Uh, it was to the everlasting credit of 211, the Tucson Warehouse and the Transport Company, that the transfer company, they boasted about this, that they moved this entire collection without any, any damage to any of the specimens. One or two pots that had been glued together did come apart, but that was the worst of the da damage. At any rate, uh, the institution, the building, real estate, was sold, was bought by the National Park Service. And